Hello, and welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. I'm Andrew Egger, editor of our Dispatch Politics newsletter, and I'm joined today by Patrick Ruffini, founding partner of the GOP polling firm Echelon Insights. He's the author of a new book, Party of the People, Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP, which I'm very excited to spend a little time talking about with him today. So, Patrick, welcome to the Dispatch Podcast. Andrew, great to be here. So this is a book uh, that exists in large part to take a stab at answering a question I think a lot of people had after the 2020 election, which is, how is it that Donald Trump, despite throwing out the previous conventional wisdom that Republicans needed to soften their message to appeal more to non-white voters, sparking a whole political movement essentially based around running up the score among the white working class, suddenly turns around in 2020 running against Joe Biden. And although he ultimately loses, he manages to pull away more non-white working class voters than any Republican in a generation. So can you walk us through how you approach tackling that question and, and essentially give us the the elevator pitch of the thesis you hit on. So I work in Republican politics, and I remember uh, the aftermath of the 2012 election. And, um, you know, Mitt Romney is kind of treated as a hero now, right, to many of his former critics for the way he's criticized Donald Trump. But the verdict on his campaign after 2012 was pretty scathing. Uh, You know, he seemed at once out of touch with both working class voters. There was infamous 47% comment. And with non-white voters, uh, with his comments about self-deportation, really trying to move to the right on immigration to shore up his base in the primary, as we saw, uh, you know, kind of reacting to the same forces that nominated Donald Trump and the uh, really strong focus on immigration in the primary electorate. Um, But, you know, it doesn't, you know, Romney's immigration message clearly doesn't land in the same way that Trump's does, because... Um, You know, he loses. He loses an election decisively and he loses despite seemingly doing better among white voters. Uh, He loses uh, despite uh, uh, the exit poll saying he won more than six in 10 white voters um, because uh, non-white voters broke against him by 80-20. And Republicans project can do math. They project this forward. And they say, well, wait a second. If this country is becoming more diverse over time, we can't keep losing. Uh, this community, these communities by 80, 20, uh, or else we'll be, we'll go extinct basically. So the, the autopsy is a really, a really bracing, uh, a, a document in the sense of, I, I don't think we've ever seen a formal party committee, uh, uh, you know, put out a document like this, that isn't just kind of a circle the wagons after the election, right? Uh, I mean, every now that it has become de rigueur to do autopsies, but they're all kind of circle the wagon documents that don't really admit fault. This one admitted fault and it specifically said the party should moderate on immigration issue. Now, Trump takes that and does the very opposite in 2016. And he wins. And he wins despite, uh, you know, he wins despite calling uh, Mexicans, rapists, and uh, bringing drugs, bringing crime, insulting the Mexican American drug uh, judge, uh, and he uh, he does no worse really than Mitt Romney did among Hispanic voters, which is a surprise to many people reading that. So that in and of itself suggested that there was an undercurrent of sentiment that, yeah, I think probably Trump's rhetoric recruited him to some extent, but it was, uh, I think, to some extent counteracted by maybe a sentiment in those communities that maybe preferred a more uh, tough guy, populist style of Republican candidate, as opposed to uh, the kinder, gentler version that the Republican establishment was trying to put forward after 2012. Yeah. And so then you fast forward four more years to 2020, ultimately not an election. Donald Trump ends up very happy with the outcome of. Uh, but but he does better than just, uh, you know, breaking even relative to Mitt Romney with a lot of these people. He he significantly overperforms with some of these populations and particularly concentrated in a few places geographically. Can you just talk about uh, what happened there? Was that expected? Uh, and 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 what what have you made of it? It was expected to the extent that you, you did see it in some pre-election polling that Trump seemed to be holding up pretty well among Hispanic voters and black voters um, that uh, actually like I, I kind of started to notice this in the summer of 2020. And it was it was notable in the in the light of the George Floyd protests then unfolding at the time that, you know, in the numbers specifically among black voters, well, he, he, the only group he seems to be losing support in is white voters. And, and that's frankly when I, I really had the idea that maybe I should write a book. Right. Because it does seem like this 
populist coalition that Trump created is becoming a multiracial one in the sense of he's winning more non-white working class voters, and especially among Black and Hispanic, the vast majority of those communities are working class in the sense of not having a college degree. Um, so this this uh, this sort of populist working class populism does seem to extend across racial lines. But I kind of shelved the idea right throughout the remainder of the 2020 election because. Uh, really didn't look like Trump was going to win. He, you know, he could lose by almost double digits, and you know, this the sort of multiracial aspect could be but a footnote in the story of the 2020 election. Fast forward to the actual election result, uh, and seven o'clock on election night, uh, you see the numbers from Miami Dade County come through, and he only loses the county by seven points after losing it by 29 points, and it it causes maybe a little bit of a political earthquake, uh, at least for a couple of hours, when people really are wondering. Uh, is this 2016 all over again? And Miami, obviously the you know cent- biggest Hispanic metropolis in America, the center of the Cuban American community. So uh, you know certainly uh, it made the election very close. It made it such that you know perhaps he is able to convince a majority of Republican voters that plaus- you know in his view plausibly that the, he really won the election and it positions him for a comeback in 2024. So a big part of the kind of data driven uh, uh, thrust of your book is this this notion that we've long kind of considered these political lines of of race and class as being fundamental, um, but that increasingly a thing we need to be looking at, as you mentioned, is educational attainment. You know, voters with versus voters without, without a college degree, even cutting across uh, racial and and income lines. Obviously, that correlates with both both class and race. But can you talk a little bit about this focus on educational attainment and why it differs from kind of the the historical way we talk about class in politics. Yeah, so it used to be that um, really income was the big dividing line in the country, and partly because education wasn't useful as a dividing line in the 20th century, because really few Americans went to college, particularly in the mid, mid-century period. So, uh, you know, white voters, it, it was particularly like a split among white voters where this is most useful, were really divided uh, on along class lines, you have measures of socioeconomic status in analysis of elections from the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and then I think after 2000, it starts to become a little bit more useful uh, as a dividing line because it's it's a rough among whites, and it really is a white education polarization uh, more so than a, an overall education polarization question in the 2016 election. Um, there's rough parity between these two groups. And you've had more people kind of go through uh, what I call the education sorting machine. Uh, the, uh, you know, have made the choice of going to college or not going to college. Whereas, you know, for an older generation, they just didn't go to college. So it's not really useful as a dividing line. Everyone is in that non-college group. You have fewer and fewer voters in those cohorts. So as a result, it really is polarized uh, along educational lines. I, I mentioned in the book right up front that in 1996, there was a 47 point gap in the margins for Bill Clinton and Bob Dole uh, between the richest voters and the uh, poorest voters. In 2020, uh, there was still a gap that benefited Joe Biden among the poorest voters, but it was only eight points that collapsed. Meanwhile, white education polarization, which is basically at zero, So white college voters and white non-college voters voted the exact same way in the 1996 election was at 39 points in 2020. Um, So it's really just replaced the old income divides. And it's really made it so that, you know, people, more people on the lower end of the economic um, spectrum are in the Republican coalition. More people on the high end are in the Democratic coalition. Mm -hmm. And you essentially attribute this, um, you know, to, to the degree that that sorting along these educational attainment lines is now seemingly becoming a thing that that cuts across income and across uh, racial lines. You 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 attribute that at least in part to the fact that there is is this kind of growing entrenched coalition of college educated white people kind of uh, uh, holding the reins of the Democratic Party and 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 pushing in a in in more and more of a direction of the issues that they care about, which are largely these sort of like social uh, identity type issues rather than rather than uh, economic matters. Yeah, and you see that in the focus, right, on abortion, democracy, right? I mean, those are the messages that Democrats are 
pushing forward, uh, you know, that are really over index pretty strongly among college educated voters. Now, and that's not to say that there isn't some political benefit to them running on the abortion issue. We've seen that in state after state after state. Um, but it, it really shows uh, you know, to some extent, it's not that it hasn't occurred to them to run on run on economics or try to, uh, you know, really try to, uh, you know, appeal to the working class on economics. It just doesn't feel like they have a very good story to tell voters right now on the economy. Um, so no matter how much they say the word Bidenomics, people aren't buying it. You have left wing you know, kind of liberal polling uh, outfits like Data for Progress going to the White House saying, you know, the more we say Bidenomics, the worse it is for us. Uh, and people just don't believe that Biden really has brought down inflation, uh, right? Uh, you know, let's, let's, you know, to some extent, you have to kind of set aside, you know, what are the actual economic statistics where the economic perceptions are absolutely horrendous um, for the Biden White House. Um, and that's really fundamentally, I mean, uh, you know, when you look at the polls right now, uh, you see a massive erosion in non-white working class support, even far beyond uh, 2016 or 2020, um, where, you know, Joe Biden in the latest New York Times Siena poll is only up by 16 points among uh, what uh, among uh, the non-white working class. Uh, he won that group by 48 points in 2020. Barack Obama won it by 67 points. Um, so even if only part of that shift materializes, that would be pretty significant. Yeah, yeah. I, it's interesting to me that you that you brought up abortion as kind of a tip of the spear issue here, because I definitely want to want to talk about that that in a, in a bit. But I did did want to bring up one other thing specifically from the book, because I one thing I really enjoyed was the kind of historical walk through that 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 you do kind of pointing out that that this class shift or rather this. Um, well, yeah, I, throughout the 20th century, it, it is more of a class shift um, of kind of working people ascending up into the lower middle class and kind of acquiring sort of more bourgeois values. And then the, the upper middle class in this new knowledge economy more recently, uh, kind of uh, ascending into a new upper middle class. Uh, and, and that th it's all kind of one story of, of this, this rising economic tide that ends up creating these kind of cultural uh, differences and, and realignments that, that, uh, play out in interesting ways in kind of the 60s and 70s. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Just because I, I just found that really interesting when I was when I was reading it. Yeah. Yeah. So this idea in academic literature called post-materialism, uh, the idea that as you move up the economic ladder, as you become wealthier, as society becomes wealthier, that voters can afford to some extent to disregard their immediate economic fortunes when they vote. Um, so this is an idea first developed um, by a political scientist named Ronald Engelhardt in the, in the 1970s. And he was looking at the post-war economies in Europe and the Nordic countries and uh, was really seeing how a, a really big generational divide in terms of how people viewed issues and what issues people prioritized. So you had younger people kind of prioritizing you know, cult, let's say cultural issues, free speech, the environment, things that were not really about kind of economics. You know, older generations prior, fo focused on the so-called material, material issues, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, uh, you know, making their next paycheck, uh, you know, uh, where's the, you know, where's my next meal going to come from? Everything from the sort of basic bread and butter economics to questions of security, crime and, and, and the like. Um, so that has played out really pretty strongly across the Western countries. And what happens is you had uh, parties of the left in the mid 20th century who had a strong appeal to those working class voters who could say, well, we will create a safety net. We will create programs that uh, will make sure that your basic material needs are met. And the parties of the right won't do that. They stand for big business. They stand for the rich. That's not only a narrative in America, that's a narrative in, you know, across the Western world. And you see that version of the left really kind of, that identity really go away, right? It's not that they don't, that's not part of their platform. That's not the ideology that, that exists on the left, but it is just much less emphasis emphasized across, across the Western world. And it's just relevant. I mean, I think you've seen many of these old labor left parties decline in relevance over time in, in a lot of these Western countries, you see the rise of a more culturally driven far right. 
uh, in Western democracies. You don't really see that here until Trump, right? But um, but you see it really happen with the rise of Le Pen in France and um, and uh, you know in the Brexit in the UK. Um, so really, parties are fighting it out based on cultural issues because society is wealthier now; <laughs> they can afford to do it, right? And um, but what you may mainly have is wealthier voters really prioritizing more and more those cultural issues, especially, and almost disregarding kind of their own, let's say, economic self-interest as being wealthier members of society who do not, should not want their, you know, kind of uh, riches taxed away. Uh, they're able to disregard that and uh, vote more on their values. And I think that you, that was probably something that was activated by Donald Trump in a way that you know, we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that kind of brings brings me back sort of to the the initial question of when you see these right wing movements, Le Pen in France or Donald Trump here or whatever, there is you know a real a real kind of racial discord component to a lot of that. And and one thing I found very interesting when you were walking through kind of the the politics of the sixties and seventies in your book is is you said you know there kind of maybe was a bit of an opportunity for working class people who had kind of become more lo like lower middle class, uh, acquired some of these bourgeois values, um, to kind of start drifting rightward in a sort of multiracial way, except for the fact that the politics of race were so strong in that era. And it kind of ended up in a situation where you had the, the white working class and the non-working class pitted against each other in a lot of ways, a lot of that internal animosity. And so at that time, really only white working class people end up drifting rightward. So if we're, if we're, if, if race kind of gets in the way then, and we're still at a very racially charged political moment now, what's different about about the current moment that has that has allowed this this shift to take place uh, that we saw in twenty twenty with with non white voters? Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, you know it's a, it, it, it's quite a bold prediction to say, for instance, that uh, if you know perhaps if the black vote were to shift a, you know in a pretty significant way for Republicans, first of all. Uh, you know, there's probably a fair amount of that that would probably come across as wish casting uh, from a Republican standpoint, because, uh, you know, we've been talking about that forever or a conservative and from trying to will that into existence forever. And it hasn't happened. And um, there's a really good book on this topic called Steadfast Democrats. Um, I had the chance to catch up for, with uh, one of the authors um, uh, to talk to her about uh, about her book and, you know, and, you know, mentioned a, a lot of that work in in. Uh, in party of the people. But um, really, I think, you know, they were, they really kind of, uh, you know, really document this trend uh, among black voters and really note how exceptional it is that it has lasted for a really long period of time. Um, so you really had really, really, really very strong racial polarization, especially in the South, but spreading to the North. Um, in throughout the 1960s, you know, leading up to the 1960s, you had very strong geographic polarization. You had, uh, you know, inner cities that were, you know, very, um, you know, very heavily majority minority, uh, and suburbs, the suburbs on right on the other side of the street were hundred percent white. Uh, and you saw this in places like Chicago, Milwaukee, right? Big cities. Um, uh, and that has faded over time, right? Those lines have faded over time. A lot of the circumstances, public opinion has, has changed over time. So about 10% of the black vote was self-described conservative in 1970. That was up to 30% by 2008. Yet nothing really changes about that democratic identity. And, you know, I think the authors argue that it's something beyond both material concerns. It's something about, uh, it's something beyond, let's say, ideology that's really driving that. Um, it really is a social taboo against defection. Um, from the dominant uh, political group that, you know, in their view, has created political power um, for Black Americans. And now you have 57, I believe in the last Congress, maybe 57 African-American members of Congress, which is, I believe, the same or more than their represented representation in the population, most of them being elected from majority white districts. Um, so it clearly has secured you know, a great deal, a, a good amount of political power, right? That uh, unity within the Democratic Party, but you also see more and more Black Republicans too, a, 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 small, a smaller number still, but an increasing number of Black Republicans get elected. So why now? Why might there be a realignment now? Well, in the latest New York Times Siena poll, you had 
uh, Trump up to 22% among black voters, which is pretty unprecedented. And you see this across polls. Um, you see this, by the way, regardless of Republican candidate or regardless of the matchup, um, that it doesn't change very much. And it seems to me that, you know, to some extent, uh, you know, if, you know, you know, we don't know exactly until if 20, until 2024 happens, um, if this will break down. But um, like a place like West Virginia, once kind of the dam breaks, right, once the social taboo, once this sort of habit of voting in one direction kind of breaks, it can move pretty quickly. We saw this really in a big way along the Rio Grande Valley in Texas, right? You had some counties that you know, were 12 people had voted in a Republican primary. And I went down there and talked to folks and they said, yeah, nobody, really, there was no Republican party. People are ostracized. If you call yourself a Republican, we all have to kind of w walk around in a secret society and we couldn't express ourselves openly until 2020. And then the dam broke and all of a sudden you have a vibrant two party system down there. So I would be presumptuous for me to predict that like a 60 year pattern in 20 will break in 2024. But it seemed there seem to be signs of it, uh, happening, at least in the polls and the voter registration numbers. So. Obviously, there's a lot for Republicans to like in the in the narrative you've you've put forward here. You also caution that kind of a, a central characteristic of the the non college educated non white voters that you spend all this time talking about is that they they are dispositionally uh, and and even ideologically relatively moderate and and you characterize them as being up for grabs and and you say you don't mean by that that they're centrists in the way that you know. People who work at think tanks can be moderates, um, trying to get between the two parties on issues, but that they are holding more eclectic views, that not necessarily ideologically sorted uh, very, um, very efficiently. So can you talk a little bit about what you see as the challenges and opportunities that that presents for the Republican Party in the next uh, several elections? Well, the challenge is really, uh, really all, many of the challenges are around Donald Trump because, you know, he was this political unicorn who realigned big segments of the American electorate in 2016 and, you know, was able to win perhaps when no one else could have won. I mean, I think that that's up for debate in that, in that, in that year, based on the coalition he put together, like who, who else would have flipped Michigan, for example. Right. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty big deal, but obviously the evidence for his contribution more recently is mixed <laughs> to say the least when he lost the 2020 election, when I think any Republican president, would have won that election, given the track record on the economy uh, prior to COVID, um, which I think was at least somewhat significant in keeping the election close. Um, you saw in the 2022 midterms, you see a lot of losing, perhaps, from Republicans. And, and, and really, like, what is going on here, right? I mean, I think there's two things. Two things are true at once. One is that the Republican coalition is just very different than what it used to be. Which means, you know, it's not necessarily doesn't doesn't mean we're all going to be carrying union cards around, um, but it does mean that the party overall in the Trump years has moderated significantly on economic issues. The old debate about the role of government is no longer really central um, to economic policy in the same way that, you know, I came of age politically during the 1990s and the contract with America. And that was like the real dividing line, right? Between Democrats and Republicans. Then you don't really see that argument being made in any kind of a serious, at least ideologically consistent way, right? I mean, I think there is some move to cut spending, but I don't think like, you know, I think the the heft and the seriousness behind those moves are not quite used what you saw in uh, the contract with America days. Um, so I, yeah, I do think that, you know, we have a challenge specifically Around Donald Trump, you know, he realigns the electorate. Um, but, you know, he also seems to be an across the board drag on Republican performance such that, you know, that majority coalition that should be possible never quite emerges. So I think, you know, a possibility I write about in my book a lot, in it, a possibility I contemplate, is that maybe it doesn't necessarily, it won't necessarily take, uh, you know, the person of Donald Trump to activate this coalition. But in the same way that, um, you know, you've had Richard Nixon, right? Historically, you, you back, if you want to look at history, right? Um, there was a realignment in the 1960s and Richard Nixon was on both sides of that realignment. He was on the side in the, 19, in the 1960 election, right? Against most working class voters. Most working class voters voted for JFK in that election. Obviously, he was a Catholic, so that helped. And then the country realigns. 
1964, 1968, uh, around the issues of war and culture and protest. And 1972, Nixon is a huge beneficiary of <laughs> this realignment uh, in American politics. Uh, and, you know, in, in 1970 as well, right? So, you know, I would say that, like, you know, how much does the individual candidate matter, right? I mean, I think there are events, just, you know, kind of events, singular events throughout history that caused this realignment. There was a realignment in the 1960s, same as there was a realignment in 2016. Now that we're on the other side of it, you know, could there be a better a better Republican candidate who can, who can still activate, still activate this populist coalition? Populist coalition? I think there, I think there, probably, I think there would probably would be. actually, actually. So to drill down a little bit on a couple of specific issues, you know, as they now appear, kind of on the other side of of that realignment, and and you know, you you mentioned that a big part of this this shift has been this this shift to cultural issues. Um, that that progressive Democrats find themselves in a smaller tent than they thought they perhaps would um, when when cultural issues are at the fore. But one obvious major complication for that in just the last couple cycles has been abortion since since uh, Dobbs v. Jackson, uh, which has emerged as a huge, seemingly cross-class issue benefiting Democrats everywhere. So I'm just curious, first of all, with, with that at the forefront as kind of one of the biggest, if not the biggest, cultural issues that voters are thinking about right now, how does that complicate the picture that you're talking about? And and is there a need, I mean, you talk about Republicans moderating on, on economic issues to kind of uh, uh, capture this coalition. Is there a similar path forward for them on abortion? Right. So... I think in some sense, uh, Trump, right, is encapsulates, uh, the, you know, the, the arc of Trump uh, appeal to the Republican Party encapsulates this whole story, whereas in 2016, it was very clear that he was a candidate who did not really want to talk about social issues and tried to present himself as a more moderate, more reasonable on some, of, let's say, these old school moral majority religious right type issues. Um, you know, you had him waving the gay flag. You had, uh, you know, him even saying, I have no problem with transgender people using restrooms in Trump Tower. Right. So, uh, you know, um, so, uh, you know, you had, he clearly tried to redefine the cultural issues away from the traditional religious right issues. And he won the Republican primary, right? He won the Republican primary really above, you know, the gatekeepers in the religious right, um, who were thought to hold kind of uh, a stranglehold on the Republican nominating process. Uh, now, he himself obviously claimed he was pro-life. So in order to do that, he agrees to appoint Supreme Court justices off a list, right, de developed by the Federalist Society, right? And that, that was sort of the bargain that he made. But it was very clear that, um, you know, he shifted. And I think that shift was a huge success. It was a huge success, not only in, in, in terms of it working, right? He shifts the cultural debate uh, onto just general kind of, I'm not going to be politically correct, onto immigration. In 2020, it's more about crime. This is sort of like the kind of politics, right? Uh, you know, the kind of right-wing politics you would see in a place like New York City to the extent, you know, you had successful uh, Republican candidates in New York City, like Rudy Giuliani, they were always campaigning on, they were pro-choice on abortion, but they were campaigning sort of as hard edge cultural warriors on cutting crime and issues like that. So that was, that was really the Trump. And it worked out really well, not just in the Republican primary, but it worked out really well in those Midwestern battlegrounds. But of course, Trump himself lays the seeds for the return of abortion as an issue, right? Um, and probably against his will, right? And, you know, he has, I think, instincts on this that are pretty different than what produced the job, the Obsidian Jackson decision in terms of, you know, saying, yeah, this issue is killing Republicans. Um, and, uh, you know, he's been outwardly, openly saying that. And he hasn't really paid a political price for it. Um, so I think his political instincts, frankly, on the on the issue are probably pretty right in terms of saying, well, you know, these, you know, in a lot of cases, these six week abortion bans go pretty far, go too far, more farther than, you know, our voters want to go. Um, I also think many of the people he brought into the coalition based on where these abortion referenda are underperforming, right, um, in the rural areas, in Trump areas, they're underperforming strongest in the rural counties. Um, which tell, tells me that, like, you know, many of his, maybe those Obama-Trump voters were not really on board 
for that social issue agenda. So it's something that Republicans certainly have to navigate. Now, um, I think the more and more states kind of have, a, you know, ironclad <laughs> constitutional provisions one way or the other, I think the less of an issue it's going to be moving forward. Um, but it's certainly a risk heading into 2024, particularly with the prospect of there being ballot initiatives in many swing states. So one one thing that you talk about happening a lot in the in the kind of late 2010s uh, with the with the Obama presidency is that that he has these particular political strengths that kind of get Democrats passed and help Democrats miss this broader demographic um, growing weakness that that Trump ends up exploiting in 2016 and 2020. And I was thinking about that when you when you start to talk about what this realignment looks like after Trump, because you you bring forward uh, you talk about Glenn Youngkin, you talk about Ron DeSantis as people who have kind of thrived uh, in this post 2020 environment where, uh, you know, Trump's not on the ballot. What's what's going on exactly. But I did want to ask, because in 2021, in retrospect, is a truly horrible year message wise for for Democrats. I mean, you 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 talk about like these culture issues just not playing well for them. I mean, that's that's the year of COVID emergence, right? That's that's the year everyone's talking about school reopenings and mask mandates and all these things. Um, and all these things that Yunkin and DeSantis both become kind of, they're able to exploit those extremely well. So I, I guess what I, what I wonder, is there a possibility when you're looking at those two guys, if you're talking about kind of permanent realignment, that you end up with too rosy a picture of, of kind of what Republicans can do once those issues have receded a little bit? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what those cases establish is not that Florida is going to be an R plus 20 state, right, in perpetuity. What that establishes, though, I, I think what is established with Youngkin in particular uh, is that he doesn't really lose any Trump voters. So the big debate, right, during, I think, during the Trump years is, can you actually put this coalition together without Trump? Can there be Trumpism without Trump? And the results of the 2016 election point to maybe not in the sense of you had a huge gap between the performance of Donald Trump and the performance of down ballot Republicans in terms of suburban voters who are really actively making a distinction between uh, the Ben Sass in Nebraska and Donald Trump, right? I mean, there was, a, you know, he had a huge overperformance in suburbs and underperformed in rural areas, or, or uh, you know, you know, kind of normie Senate Republican. So let's say in certain standard normie Senator, Senate Republican, you have this huge differentiation on the map, right, in terms of where they. Who, which member of the Republican ticket performed strongest where. So that kind of suggested that, like, you know, we have to really choose a path here between the more populist uh, uh, coalition Trump is putting together and the more, let's say, sane, normal suburban coalition, the more Romney plus coalition, right, that, um, that, uh, that other Republicans put together. That differentiation disappears in post-2016 because all of those, many of the suburban voters just become Democrats and realign into the Democratic Party. And many of those rural voters realign into the Republican Party and are now down but straight ticket Republican voters and straight ticket Democratic voters. So I don't think we're going back to anything, anything resembling a Romney style coalition. And when you see with someone like Brian Kemp, right, um, you, you know, and, and even Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, and so you look at the coalitions, right, that they put together for their elections, obviously they out, outperform Donald Trump. I don't think it's, uh, there's a serious question why they outperform Donald Trump, but, but really what they're able to do is, you know, they don't get any less fewer votes than Donald Trump anywhere in the state, Right. They don't lose. They're not offending MAGA vote, bag of voters. Bag of voters aren't staying home. MAGA voters aren't splitting their tickets against Brian Kemp or the guy who got Trump in hot water with the Fulton VA. Uh, they're still voting for those candidates, but they get more suburban voters. So you have somewhat less polarization, but it's nowhere near kind of Mitt Romney level. So you know, Kemp gets maybe a third of the old Romney vote back in terms of the Romney, maybe Clinton, Romney, Biden vote back. But it's not a full reversal of the realignment. So I think it's just an acknowledgement of reality. I think it's also, uh, you know, possibly more optimistic uh, take in the sense of, uh, you know, I think there are many different types of candidates who could run and win with this coalition. So the book is Party of the People Inside the Multiracial Populist Coalition Remaking the GOP. I've been talking to Patrick Ruffini, the author. It's a really interesting book. Recommend going and reading it. Thank you for coming on the podcast today. It's been fun. 
Thanks, Andrew.